I'm gonna stay standing here because there's so many of you. And you guys can come in a little bit tighter if you want. I don't think we're gonna have a fire drill out here. <laughs> That's why I do these tours like once a spring and then I try to apologize to my neighbors like the rest of the year. <laughs> when I started doing these, I only had one person come and it really sucked. <laughs> Cause I was like, I don't know this person and I gotta now be with you for like an hour and a half. <laughs> what is that? It grows the best during the summertime. I can get a eight an eight inch height of wheatgrass in like five days oh. from seed. I let it grow, I cut it, juice it, let it grow a second time, juice that, and then it's kind of like just running on fumes, so I just kind of compost it. And then you're done. Or let my it. tortoise. <laughs> and I do a whole new tray. So I'll get like ten trays going at once on a shelf and I'll stagger them five days apart or so. So I always got one cooking. Or just go to Whole Foods and buy <laughs> it for two bucks a shot. Um, Please do it every day. It's one of the main ways you can really clean your body out is the wheatgrass juice. So you want one of those Omega juicers that goes really slow with a powerful motor and it kind of, it's like an extruding juicer that kind of twists it horizontally, you know what I mean? It has that cone with the, with the spinny guys on it. Okay. I think mine's an Omega 8005J or something. Should we start our class? Yes. That's the intro. And I lived in China for a while in college and I studied Mandarin, and in China they believe that the goal of longevity is to live a life without sickness and then die quick. I, I like it. Right? And then in America we do the opposite. Everybody lives kind of sick all the time and then dies like a really Slowly. slow death in the hospital. Yeah. I've never recorded one of these before because I'm always busy with you guys, but my man Grant's given his time today, so treat him to lunch later on today. Yeah. I meet couples all the time, and there's never a couple where both are gardeners. There's always one person that loves gardening and one person holding them back. <laughs> so who's the gardener and who's holding them back? See how they came with them just to hold them back. So in the front yard here, about three years ago, I chose to grow these bushes. This yellow one's a brittle bush. This one is a wolfberry. This one is a wolfberry. This purple one is a globe uh, mallow. These are all uh, native to the Sonoran Desert. The yellow one is an Indian mallow, and I get them from the Desert Botanical Gardens plant sale or uh, Sing Farms. Sing Farms has some natives as well. They're only open on Saturdays though, Sing Farms. Um, but these have a really important purpose because they are drought tolerant. I don't, I don't need to have an irrigation system for them. And they speak the language of bee and butterfly. So if you go to my other neighbors who have just a rock front yard, you won't see an abundance of bees or butterflies in their yard. But if you come to mine just a few steps away, the bees and the butterflies, this is their language and they'll come into your yard. They'll pollinate your fruit trees and you'll get more food because you spoke their language in the, in the front. So I speak a little Mandarin because I studied it in college and I, I still do some lessons, but this is the language of bee. You go to China, you speak the, you speak the Zhongwen. You go to butterfly and bee, you speak this. So these varieties are pretty good. And the wolf berries and the goji berry family. So each one of these purple flowers in about a month produces a red fruit that's edible. And I do a lot of backpacking in Phoenix, starting about now till the fall. And I always see the wolfberries out in the Sonoran Desert. And nobody eats them, even though the bush will be six feet tall by 10 feet wide, and it's loaded with red fruits. And nobody eats it because everybody's mom scared the crap out of them as a kid and said, don't eat the red fruit. And then, and then showed them that Brooke Shields movie, The Blue Lagoon, where at the end they eat the red berries, right? So uh, if you know what the edible fruits is, the desert is a refrigerator for you. And prickly pear cactus and wolfberries are two really important sources of food. My favorite cactus to grow that's fruiting is the Peruvian apple. See these guys on the border of my property? Those are all grown from one arm and they're called Peruvian apple and they're still growing. They're not really big yet. And they produce a big cactus fruit called a tunas or a tuna. And it's like dragon fruit on the inside but it grows in the full sun where dragon fruit needs a little bit of shade here in Phoenix. So if you go to Lowe's, they'll sell you an arm for 50 bucks. But if you know what Peruvian apple looks like, you can just break an arm off one in the common area somewhere around town and just bring it to your house. Just don't break mine off because I'll, I'll come after you. <laughs> and also, it's kind of fun to talk about where your cactus came from. You know, my father-in-law, Lou, he's the one that told me about this. And now a little bit of him is in my garden always, you know, even though he's passed on. So. We've got the Peruvian apple. See my, this tree full of sticks right there? It's just starting to get its leaves. Can you see the green leaves just growing? That's a jujube. It's our second tree on the list. So moringa number one, jujube number two, 
and a fig tree number three. Fig, any variety grows so well. My baby fig is right here, but I have six more in the back that are a little bigger. Any variety. I like the brown turkey or the Texas blue giant. Who has never had a fig before? Who has never had a ripe fig before that's not dehydrated? You've got to grow them. They're so amazing. They fruit twice a year and they grow great here. And um, pretty much any fruit in the Bible is what we should be growing, like figs and all this stuff. So um, number, is that three trees now? Yeah. yeah. Number four is date palm. Any female fruiting date palm. So these palms are not a date palm. What is it, like a California fan palm? But the one over behind you guys over there, behind that pine tree, that is a date palm. So let's say that that date palm is about 25 years old. And if that had dates on it in about six months from now and you eat one, plant the seed. It'll grow a tree, but it could be a male that only produces pollen. It could be a different variety of date that you don't like. The only way to get the date palm that you want to eat is to take a pup off the bottom of the mom. So see on the bottom of that tree, all those kind of suckers? It looks like a, like a, like a skirt. Those are all extra palms. There's like $3,000 of date palms on that tree. If somebody were to dig those pups off and sell them for 300 bucks a piece, they would sell, and those would be the exact same tree as the mom. We are in one of the most rare climates on the planet for growing dates, either like the Middle East and Phoenix and Southern California. Florida has a hard time growing dates, it's so, it's so humid. So really the number one tree you should plant in your garden is a female fruiting a date palm of any variety. And then learn through my YouTube videos how to pollinate it. We have a whole series coming out, uh, we just filmed part one yesterday of how to pollinate your dates to maximize your production. Any kind of citrus, citrus trees do great here. So that's number five, is that number five? Yeah. Okay, any kind of citrus. I like tangelos and mandarin quats. I like grapefruit. I like the cara cara navel orange, which is pink on the inside. Um, I also like any kind of pomelo. And you guys can go to urbanfarm.org. My friend Greg Peterson does a fruit tree nursery. Or Greenfield Citrus Nursery has some good citrus trees. And they've been around forever. I, got, I just planted this one a couple days ago. When I garden, I try to grow in raised beds. A lot of my friends grow in the ground and they think that in the ground is a more Native American style to garden. And they think that it keeps the plants cooler in the summertime. But I have found that raised beds just look kind of nice. They can be built out of brick or wood or whatever. And you can control the soil better. Right. Um, grass will stay out better and you can kind of control like chicken wire on the bottom to block rodents. You can put cardboard, mm -hmm. sheets of cardboard on the bottom to block grass and all this jazz. So I like growing in raised beds and I just get the redwood uh, fence board from a hardware store. I can build a six foot by three foot raised bed for like $17. And then the soil to fill it is like uh, 50 bucks. So for 60, 65 bucks, I got a raised bed at six foot by three foot. I can grow about 20 plants in there and it's a lot of fun. If you guys are not yet gardening, start with one raised bed this weekend and one fruit tree, then get addicted <laughs> and then instead of investing in the stock market, invest in your garden. Yeah, okay. yeah. exactly. So this is a fennel plant, tastes like licorice. Yeah. It's a really good uh, butterfly attractor. This bed is, this is the worst my raised beds have looked here because I'm growing some weird stuff. Potatoes under the ground, New Zealand spinach, some new sweet peppers, more potatoes. And this bed is newly planted with a uh, Jerusalem artichoke or Ooh. called a uh, sunchoke. And that one just popped up. See that one right there in the front? Mm -hmm. So in two months, this bed will be a huge bed of sunflowers, and underneath the ground are the tubers that are like potatoes. A sunchoke or a Jerusalem artichoke can be eaten raw like a water chestnut or cooked like a potato. So if you go to Whole Foods and spend six bucks, get a pound of sunchokes, cut them all in half, plant them, you'll never have to buy sunchokes again. When I grow a raised bed and I build the box, I just build the box of wood and put it on the ground like a coffin, I bury somebody inside of it, and then I put the dirt on the ground. Yeah, right. Okay. I like your shoes, by the way. Those are awesome. Oh, yeah. Get more <laughs> the same, same shoes. Same. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Oh, exactly. great. So what I do for the raised bed is I do a soil mix I found over the years works best, and it's on this side of this card right here. I think Pam has these for three bucks because we just uh, built them waterproof and kind of like durable. So if you guys want to keep this with you on the garden, but if you want to write it down right now for free, just do that. So the bottom half of my raised bed is straight compost. Am I over anybody's head yet? No. Does anybody not know what compost is? Half of you don't know what compost is and you're not putting your hand 
<laughs> Compost and dirt are different things, right? The yeah. dirt is what my driveway is made out of. It's that right. clay. Compost is a living organism. Mm -hmm. right. And it's usually black, mm -hmm. and it's what the plants want to grow in. So the compost is your vegetable broth in the soup. Then the top half of the raised bed, I do a mixture of worm castings, more compost, uh, coconut core, also called coconut pith, and rock dust minerals. The problem with even organic food nowadays, I think that the, orga the label organic is kind of BS. Mm. Do we have any kids in the audience? Can I say bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very corporate now. And right, they're doing anything they can to just have that label. So who knows what the soil was like where that food was, even if it was organic, it could have been depleted soil. That's why when you go to the store and you eat the most beautiful piece of fruit, mm. but it tastes like nothing because mm. of the soil. Mm. They're designing and they are growing the food to look great on the shelf. Yeah. Right. But it's just water inside. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that our great grandparents ate a lot better than us. Mm -hmm. They sure um, and they were probably could beat you in arm wrestling because their strength was better because of it too. <laughs> so the rock dust yeah. minerals is really important to put in your soul because that's remineralizing your food. So when you eat out of your garden, it's healthier than any organic food from Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. But you just take it and like my pepper plants, just throw yeah. some around the peppers and then water it in and it will just water into the soil. How many of you are trying to grow food but you're spending way too much money trying to produce one tomato. <laughs> like $8,000 for the first tomato. That's, that's the learning curve in the beginning. But I promise after your infrastructure is built, okay. gardening becomes very cheap and very easy and very renewable. Because as you keep at it, your soil gets better every year and you get better as well. So in year four and five, it's easy to grow if you're in year one and two, stick with it because you'll get better. Like in the martial arts, you start as white belt and the only difference between a white belt and a black belt is the white belt did not give up. Right. Yeah. They might have sucked, but they kept with it and became the exactly. badass later. Mm -hmm. right? As of all things in life. Like all things, right? right? Okay. So in the top half is worm castings, coconut core, compost, and rock dust. The coconut core just looks like this. Okay. Okay, I get this from A and P nursery. A and P. They're, they're around town, their local nursery is 10 bucks. Remember in the bathtub when you were a kid, the dinosaur capsule you put in the bathtub and it becomes a foam sponge? <laughs> this is the same thing for adults. <laughs> okay? You put it in the bathtub. No, I'm just kidding, don't do that. No. You put it in a bucket or in a wheelbarrow, put okay. water on it, and it absorbs the water and becomes a kind of a very like spongy growing medium. This doesn't have any nutrition for your plants. It just is able to retain the moisture the, the in water, the soil. Sure. So in Arizona, without this, you're going to suck. Yeah, yeah. I'm I telling you. That. Yep. And with this, you're going to be much, much better because you'll have a more consistent moisture level in your soil. But also put worm castings. If you guys know Seamus O'Leary, he's open today on 32nd Street and Baseline. He has a really good kind called Worm Gold Plus. You can also raise your own worms. Right. Like Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I used to do that. I had a worm tower for a few years and raised my own worms. But now I have so many worms under my wood chips. There's worms everywhere in my yard. So get the worm castings. It looks like coffee grounds, but this is like the wheatgrass juice for your plants. Mm -hmm. Like how I brought that back full circle? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is like black gold, and there's also some local sources like uh, vermilove. So far, so good. How many fruit trees do we have so far on our list? Let's five, do a recap. Five. What are the five? Moringa tree does well here? Jujube. Jujube. Now, jujube, when they grow the fruit, it's like an apple. And then it will dehydrate down on the tree to a red, shrivelly, date-like fruit. And, it, and it's the consistency of a donut. It's fantastic. It's really amazing. And they're so prolific here. And there's many varieties. I have a lee, a long, and a contorted. And usually you'll get them. Who does not know what a bare root tree is? I don't think I do. When you sometimes buy a fruit tree for 20 bucks from a nursery, it comes like a stick and that's it. And the roots are hanging off or it's in a pot, but it just got put in that pot before you got there. Yeah. That's pretty common and that's okay. A lot of my trees came as bare roots okay. and then they wake up for the spring in your soil in your yard. So right now is a good time to plant some fruit trees because they can get established before the liquid magma of Phoenix hits. <laughs> okay, I was born in Canada and someday I want to move back there but for now I'm in this hellhole of, no, just kidding. <laughs> I love Phoenix. 
I started loving Phoenix a lot more the more I traveled the world because it's so unique here and I love hiking here and you can go to so many different climates whether you go north or south huh. it's an amazing state but I do like where I was born in mm -hmm. Whistler and Vancouver Ooh, and cold. skiing Ooh, and all that stuff. Oh yeah. Um, I love so, these anybody want to manage this property for me when I move back to Canada? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Uh, let's go in the back and see what I got growing on back there, and we'll talk about fruit trees, and uh, we'll finish our list of 13 fruit trees, and I'll show you how I'm feeding my fruit trees to keep them healthy and grow rapidly, even though they're only six years old.